All right, everybody. Who is ready for more insanity involving the Romans? Hopefully, you're saying yes. Tell me more crazy things and not, uh, no, I've heard enough already. So today I'm going to explain to you and go through fill in the blank notes about Augustus. Now you will remember from the notes from, I almost said notes from yesterday, but I guess it was notes from two days ago. Um, Augustus and Octavian are the same person. So we're going to talk about his time um, being in charge. And then we're going to talk about the emperors that came after him. And just to give you a clue, the, the Google slides I made, look what it's called. Emperors behaving badly. Oh yeah, it's going to get nuts. All right, so let's start with Augustus. So Remember how Octavian, a.k.a. Augustus, um, defeated Mark Antony in battle, so he is now the only one left in that second triumvirate. So, he says to the Roman government that I want to bring back old-school Roman government. What that means is, like, no more triumvirates. Let's have a republic again with consuls and all that kind of stuff. And the Senate could be powerful again, and all that. But there's a catch. He says, okay, here's our new Republic government, but I am going to be consul, tribune, high priest, and senator all at the same time. Time. He essentially brings back the Roman Republic, but... It's not really a republic if he's in charge of a lot of things, which is why in history, Augustus is kind of known as the first emperor of Rome because he has complete power. But um, there's a catch to that, and I'm going to talk more about that in a second. But just to give you the idea, um, and I know some of us might be horrified in this situation, but um, that would be like the president of the United States being president, attorney general, uh, leader of all religion, and in charge of the Senate all at once. And you'd be like, oh, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, here's how he does it. He refuses to be crowned emperor. There are some people that are like, Augustus, you are so great. You defeated that jerk Mark Antony and his Egyptian woman because you know how the Romans feel about Cleopatra. Um, so he, he, he has some supportive people are like, you should be in charge of our empire. You should be an emperor. And Augustus says, no, 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 no. Do not call me an emperor because he remembers what happens to people in Rome if they're the only one in charge. Um, but he finds a loophole. He says, don't call me emperor, but give me the power of an empire of an emperor by being in charge of all those things. And that's what happens. He keeps the assembly. So the every citizen in Rome has a voice. Um, government officials like working for him and he makes the senators feel honored all the time. Um, if there was a Senate that was like, oh, Augustus, he's kind of a little too powerful. Maybe we should do something. Augustus would be like, oh, Senator so-and-so, you are so great. I'm going to give you an award and give you all this money and all these things because you're such a valuable part of our government. So that Senator would be like, maybe Augustus isn't so bad having this power. I feel honored. I'm not going to do to him what they did to Caesar, where they felt their power was threatened. So Augustus technically is the first emperor but he refuses to be crowned emperor, but he has all the power of one. And the reason he refuses to be crowned, uh, crowned emperor, emperor he, the reason why he refuses to be crowned, crowned, why can't I speak? Why? Somebody fix this. Hold on. I did a lot of notes videos today, so maybe that's why. Let's see. Let's see if I can not stumble my words again. Here we go. The reason he refuses 
to be crowned emperor is he doesn't want people to do to him what they did to his uncle Julius Caesar. All right. So he strengthens his authority, though, in Rome. He have every soldier in the Roman legions swear allegiance to him personally to prevent rev revolution. Um, they are not swearing allegiance to Rome. They are swearing allegiance to him. So it would be like, all right, so take the Pledge of Allegiance, which we haven't said in so long. Um, it's kind of weird. In like two and a half months, we haven't pledged allegiance to the flag. Or maybe some of you have. I don't know. Um, but if I was to reword it for Augustus to make up like this oath of allegiance, it would be like, I pledge allegiance to Augustus and Rome and to the Republic. Uh oh, -uh, Republic. There we go. For which it stands, one nation. Well, I guess it wouldn't be one nation, one empire uh, under Jupiter, because Jupiter is uh, the Roman version of Zeus, with liberty and justice for citizens only and not women, children, and slaves. That would probably be the oath. All right, so he strengthens authority. He chose people for jobs based on talent rather than who their family was. Now, I know that seems like common sense today, like you should pick someone for the job that is most qualified and not who they know. Um, but in ancient Rome, and unfortunately that still happens at some, sometimes today, um, in ancient Rome, what would happen a lot of times is people would be doing certain jobs and they wouldn't be great at it. And the only reason they have their job is because of who their, their dad is. Um, so Augustus is like, I don't care who your father is. If you're not qualified for the job, I'm not hiring you. Next. He expands the empire to create cataracts. Now, this is a throwback. I've been talking about cataracts all year, but here we go. It's when geography protects you, and I'm going to show you what that means. It's an empire map. I should have had this ready to go, but I just realized that when I started doing these notes, I just realized, wait, where's my empire? Now this one, this one's, it's not, it's like blood red. Uh, <laughs> so to expand the cataracts so that Rome controls the entire Mediterranean Sea. Look at this. There is no piece of the Mediterranean Sea and then also the Aegean Sea, the Adriatic Sea, uh, the Ionian Sea. Rome has control of all of it. Um, this is what is today Spain and Portugal. This is France. They got what is today Britain. They got lots of countries in um, Western Europe. There's their homeland, Italy. Uh, they got Greece, Macedonia, what's today Turkey. They're into... Uh, what is today Iraq and Mesopotamia. They got Egypt. They got all of North Africa. Augustus expands this so that they have protection from geography. And what was happening here is over here you have um, some mountains and rivers that are the boundaries. You have over here the Black Sea that has some boundaries. You got the desert over here with boundaries. Desert. Over here were the, some boundaries, and then obviously the Atlantic Ocean. So they're pretty well protected. Augustus did that. He also pays government workers really well, so they wouldn't be tempted to overtax the people and keep money for themselves. So he gives people a fair wage, and when you give people a fair wage, people are going to work better for you. Now, here's some good things Augustus did. He creates the census, and it's really interesting that this word comes up because 2020 is a census year. Some of you might be hearing a lot about the census um, this year over the past couple months because it's a census year, and this is something that Augustus created. Augustus created the census because the census is a population count. 
show. And I know some of you knew that. Um, and some of you might be like, oh, I've heard the word census, but now I know what it is. Or some of you were like, I never heard it, but now I know. Um, so it's counting the population to ensure that you have um, enough things for your people. So the United States does a census every 10 years. So 2020 is a census year. The last time we did it would obviously be 2010. And one of the important things that we use the census for is you might remember the House of Representatives, one of our, our parts of Congress, um, it's based on population. So the way that they, they determine which states get a certain number of representatives is through the census, which is why it's really important for families to fill out the census information. And your family might have, well, I think the, the percentage in Leonia is pretty high. It's like, I think 70 something percent of Leonians have already done the census. So um, your family probably have done it, or if they haven't, um, they probably will be doing it too soon. All right, he makes Rome look beautiful. Um, he cleans up the streets, makes it pretty slash handsome, becomes a very nice place to be. He also creates laws to ensure that people will behave themselves in public. Now, this next thing is going to be kind of like, oh man. Um, but so Rome has this problem because... Um, it, let's just say they have uh, a problem of people going to the bathroom in the middle of the street, um, which creates a pretty gross smell all over. Um, so Augustus is the first person that says, uh, you can't go to the bathroom in public. You got to do that somewhere else in private so you're not stinking up the place. He sets up a fire department and a police force. He also builds Rome, builds Rome's first public library, not the first library ever. You might remember that was our friend from the Assyrians, Asher Banapal. Um, we learned about him way back in December. He's the first person to make a library in Rome. Now, he rules for 41 years and there is peace during his time period that he is the ruler. And this time period is called the Pax Romana. So Pax Romana is a Latin phrase. Romana means Rome and Pax means peace. So it translates to mean Roman peace. So the 41 years that he's in charge, there's complete peace. And then it goes on to have peace for 200 more years. So Rome is at peace for 241 years. Now there's many reasons for it. Reason number one, they got lots of cataracts to protect them if anyone tried to mess. Reason number two is um, the things that Augustus kind of started, they um, continued for 241 years which is pretty impressive because if you think about the United States, okay? So what year was the United States created? I'm pausing like Dora so you can shout out the answer. Uh, the correct answer is 1776 is our birthday year. July 4th, 1776 is known as the official birthday of the United States. So, right now, we will be turning this July 4th, 244 years old. So, right now, we're 243 years old. Um, July 4th will be our 244th birthday. That is a couple years more than how long the Romans were at peace for 241 years. So, just to give you an idea... The United States hasn't been at peace for like 20 years, let alone 241 years. Um, so it's a pretty impressive thing that the Romans did. Now, this peace means increased trade. The same coins were used throughout the empire. There were no tariffs. A tariff is a tax 
that gets placed on um, a product that's coming into the country. And the Mediterranean is pirate free. Why is it pirate free? Because the Romans control every inch of it. That's why it's pirate free. So it's pretty safe. Now, more trade means more money for Rome, and a lot of Romans grow rich. Italy becomes the place to be to get pottery, bronze, cloth, wine, and olive oil. And today, wine and olive oil are still major products of Italy. And also you could say um, clothing because there's a lot of um, fashion designers from Italy. Now, during the Pax Romana, Roman law changes. When Rome conquered a new land, they had to write new laws that would be fair to the newly conquered non-Romans. And there were judges that worked on these laws, and they were helped by special lawyers and legal writers called juris prudentis. So they helped establish Roman law in the new territories that the Romans conquered. So laws started to be fair to everyone. Now there's a little pause here. Unfortunately, once again, not women, not children, not slaves. Um, it should really read laws started to become, you know what? I'm changing it now. I am changing. You're going to watch. I'm not writing everyone. I'm going to write all citizens because unfortunately women, children, and slaves, they don't get equal protection in the law in Rome. Um, a law is believed to be just meaning fair because it was reasonable not because the government had the power to make people obey. And in ancient Rome, a person is considered innocent until proven guilty, just like how it's supposed to work in the United States. But obviously we know sometimes that doesn't happen. Now, by 125 CE, yes, not BCE, CE, like, like past year zero, um, Roman law becomes standardized, meaning it was the same all over the empire. Now, what happens next in Rome? It's a really good thing over these next years that I'm about to talk about that the Romans were at peace because there's about to be lots of crazy people in charge. So, Here's what happens next, my little emperors behaving uh, 